Welcome back to the playlist on analytical chemistry and instrumental analysis. So just to review what we were doing in the last video, we talked a little bit about this phenomenon right here, which is called fluorescence. Okay, And just to do a quick recap of what we talked about, in fluorescence, what ended up happening is, you know, we started out with the electrons, you know, really comfortable down here in the ground state, right? Here's the ground state electronic configuration, okay? And what we ended up doing is we had the molecule or atom, whatever it may be, absorb a photon of light. So just to, um, you know, give you some really important information before we really get into um, what we're going to talk about in this video, which is resonance fluorescence, a special case of fluorescence, just to remind you, we have this really important equation where the energy of a photon, so the energy of a photon, is basically equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light, and then we divide that by the wavelength, which consequently is also equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of light. Okay? And based on this equation, you would guess that the frequency of light is also equal to the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by the wavelength of light. So these are some important identities to realize. Um, notice that when we're talking about wavelength versus energy of the photon, notice how the wavelength, shown as lambda here, is inversely proportional to the energy of the photon. So what that means is that at high energies, a photon, that corresponds to lower wavelengths. Uh, inversely, we could also show that low energy of photon corresponds to high wavelengths, okay? And also note that energy is directly proportional to the frequency shown here, but really what I'm going to be focusing on in this video is the energy and the wavelength. Those are the two most common things that you deal with. So if I'm looking at these singlet excited states, let's, for example, look at S1. That's what we're going to be dealing with. In another video, we'll actually look at S1 versus S2 and you know, figure out what the difference might be between those. But from an analytical chemistry perspective, you don't really need to know much about the difference between them. But what you do need to know is, for example, this, this bold line right here, if you're looking, say, at this energy state okay, versus this one that I'll do in purple, versus maybe this one up here, the one at the top is going to be the highest energy, right? If you notice the vertical axis here, this is energy right here. And so this state would be the highest energy. Consequently, it would also correspond to the lowest wavelength. But if I'm looking at the energy where this red dot is, that's going to correspond to the lowest energy and consequently the highest wavelength. And the reason I know that is because of these famous equations where you have energy of the photon is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the wavelength of light. Okay, And so basically what happens is as I go from the red dot to the purple dot, the energy is increasing. And as I go down, the energy is decreasing. Likewise, if I'm going up, the wavelength is decreasing. And if I'm going down, the wavelength is increasing because energy and wavelength are inversely proportional to one another. Okay? And basically what we talked about in fluorescence is I could start out with, you know, I could start out with the electrons sort of in their ground state. You know, that's where they're happiest. If I come over here and look at this diagram, this would represent the ground state of electrons. If I want to be really specific right here, this would be the highest occupied molecular orbital or the HOMO. And I know that because there's no electrons occupying any of the orbitals that are above this orbital. And then the first one I find, um, the, lowest, the lowest energy one in which there's no electrons in there at rest, this would be called the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital or the LUMO. Okay? And so if I absorb light, a photon of light, what I can do is I can basically promote electronic movement from the HOMO into the LUMO. So electrons can sort of jump um, from the HOMO to the LUMO. And that's sort of what I see maybe in the singlet excited state right here. So both the singlet and the triplet state, these are both excited states of this molecule right here, which is formaldehyde. Okay, These are both excited states, and maybe we'll have a video one day on what the difference between singlet and triplet state might be. But essentially, when you promote an electron um, from the HOMO to the LUMO, notice how you can effectively view this electron 
which has a downward spin, essentially gets promoted into this orbital right here. And so you end up with semi-occupied molecular orbitals. Okay. And so this represents a singlet excited state. So if I come back over here and look at this diagram, you know, we talked about how, you know, you can excite electrons into higher energies, maybe in this singlet excited state. Now, if you're talking about energies like this, so maybe something right there, something right here, something right here, here, or even here, notice how um, in their excited state, there has to be some vibrational relaxation until basically you get to this energy, which we basically call the red dot. So at this energy, um, anything that gets absorbed by a photon that's higher in energy, there has to be some vibrational relaxation to get back down to this sort of solid line that we denoted with red. Okay, but see, there's a big difference between normal fluorescence and this special case, which we call resonance fluorescence. Because in resonance fluorescence, okay, let's look, for example, at the highest wavelength that will elicit fluorescence. Well, if I'm looking at the highest wavelength that will elicit fluorescence, of course, I start off in the ground state, but the highest wavelength is going to be right here, this arrow that points up directly to that line, right? So right here, we just went up to this energy, the singlet excited state, and this represents the highest wavelength and consequently the lowest energy that can, that can elicit fluorescence. Okay, so you know we're gonna spend some a little bit a short period of time, very short period of time in this excited state. You know, we make the electrons a little bit uncomfortable. They don't like to be in the excited state. And then what's gonna happen is they're going to fluoresce. Okay, and when they fluoresce, they're going to um, emit a photon, but in resonance fluorescence, they're going to emit the photon with the same energy as it took to excite the electron into the excited state. So notice how basically these energies between the red solid line and the green solid line, they're exactly the same energies, right? Because I, I denote that by having these lines as the same length upwards. Okay, so the key with resonance fluorescence is the, the photon that's absorbed has exactly the same wavelength and energy as the photon that gets emitted. It's a transition between two states in which you have the same spin quantum number. Notice this is S1, and that's the same spin quantum number as S sub zero right here. But it's, it produces radiation and emits a photon, okay? But for resonance fluorescence to happen, these energies, the energy of the absorbed photon and the energy of the emitted photon have to be exactly the same. But see, there's a big difference between resonance fluorescence and normal fluorescence because with normal fluorescence, what could happen is the atom or molecule could absorb a photon with greater energy than is needed to produce fluorescence, okay? So notice how if I used this blue line, what has to happen is you have to do, basically in the context of this picture, you have to do three cases of vibrational relaxation to basically get down to uh, the minimum energy or the maximum wavelength needed to produce fluorescence, okay? Because once you get down to that point that I just, um, basically, I put an arrow to and starred. Once you get to this point, then you can do fluorescence, and that represents the maximum wavelength and the min minimum energy needed to produce fluorescence. Okay, But if you absorb a photon that's higher in energy than this energy that's in red, um, then you're going to have to do some vibrational relaxation in order to get to that point where you can do fluorescence. So that's going to be normal fluorescence that we talked about in the last video. Okay, But if you absorb a photon equal to you know, this energy right here, and then you do um, a transition from S1 to S0 in which you emit a photon of the exact same energy and wavelength of the absorbed photon, that's what we call resonance fluorescence. And it's just a special case of fluorescence, again, where we'll say basically that the wavelength of the absorbed photon is going to be equal to the wavelength of the emitted or the fluoresced photon. Okay. Another way of saying that, because um, we also know that wavelength corresponds to energy, 
the energy of the absorbed photon is going to be equal to the energy of the emitted photon or the fluoresced photon. So this is a really important thing to understand about resonance fluorescence is that uh, for this to be valid, basically the wavelength of absorption has to be equal to the wavelength of fluorescence and the energy of absorbance has to be equal to the energy of the fluoresced or emitted photon. Okay, so in other words, basically what you have to have, the, the distinction, is this energy right here that I'm starring in gray has to be equal to this energy that I'm starring in gray. Okay, and just keep in mind, it's, it, it's the energy of those photons that are absorbed and emitted that have to be exactly the same. And if you have that condition satisfied, then you have resonance fluorescence. Okay. If, for example, you had vibrational relaxation either from the singlet excited state down to this sort of red line right here that I starred, or you fluoresce a little bit to a slightly higher uh, S sub zero, and then you do a little bit more vibrational relaxation, that's not resonance fluorescence. Resonance fluorescence has the distinction of being where these wavelengths are equal and the energies are therefore equal as well. If you have any of this vibrational relaxation that occurs either in the singlet excited state or the S sub zero state, then that's just fluorescence, okay? So any of these transitions right here that, you know, any of the transitions that are basically shown right here in light blue any of these transitions qualify as fluorescence right but just to recap resonance fluorescence has the wavelength of absorbance equal to the wavelength of emission and the energy of absorbance equal to the energy of emission okay so i hope that video helped you get a little bit of grasp on resonance fluorescence um, in the last video we looked at fluorescence in the next video, we'll look at some of the things like internal conversion, inner system crossing, and hopefully get a grasp on that. See you in the next video.